Hey scholars, good to be back with you. Today I'd like to talk to you about how to analyze a falling ball. Now we do this a lot in physics class, but we almost always ignore aerodynamic drag. Well, what happens when you don't ignore aerodynamic drag? Well, you get a lot better answer, a lot more realistic, matches experiment a lot better, but it's mathematically a little more uh, involved. So, let's try it. Let's start with a ball. I'm going to start with a ping pong ball. Now, I had, what, had a ping pong ball here, but I gave it to a very young visitor to my office, so we'll have to imagine a ping pong ball. Let's just draw one. And draw the forces on it, maybe. There's the weight. That's mass times ex uh, acceleration and gravity. And this is my aerodynamic forces. All right, well, what are the aerodynamic forces? Well, if you ever take a class in fluid mechanics, you'll find out that the aerodynamic force, which is the drag force, the force of the, of the air moving past the ball that tends to slow it down, is CD, which is a non-dimensional drag coefficient, times 1 half rho v squared s. And let's see, 1 half is just a number. Rho is the uh, density of air. And at sea level, under ideal conditions, it's around 1.23 kilograms per meter cubed. We'll, we'll call it 1.2, that's close enough. B is velocity, and S is the cross-sectional area of the ball. So if I were to, you know, cut the ball, that, that right there, that's S. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. Well, let's write... Uh, the equations of motion using Newton's law. Well, the sum of the forces has to equal ma, and let's let's say x positive is down. Okay, remember physics doesn't know or care anything about your coordinate system; it just works. So we'll we'll uh, assume x positive down just so we have a way of keeping track of everything. And what we'll find out is mg minus cd one half rho v squared s equals m a. Well, that's Newton's law. Well, there's a v there and an a there. Mm, looks like two variables, one equation. Not so good. Let's do this. Acceleration is just the first derivative of velocity with respect to time. And if you want to write that a slightly different way, it means the same thing. There. That's the differential equations there, kids. Well, yeah, that's not so terrible. All physical laws that I know of uh, are written in terms of differential equations. It shouldn't be too surprising that this one is too. Now, this is a first-order differential equation, since it's just a first derivative. It's first derivative in uh, velocity. So we're going to need one initial condition. Well, what's the initial condition? Well, let's say that you hold the ball out and drop it. So our initial condition Initial condition is that velocity at time zero is zero. All right, that doesn't sound too hard. Well, we're all conditioned to be horrified with differential equations. We're all conditioned to be scared of them. There's no need. This is just an equation with a slope in it. Equations can have variables. Could they have the slopes of variables? Sure. And as I said, pretty much all physical laws, at least the ones that engineers will ever use, are written in terms of differential equations. So they're, they're pretty important. Well, this one's a particularly easy one to solve. I'm going to solve it two different ways. One way is we're going to try to solve it analytically here on the board, and the other one is we're going to solve it numerically. We're just going to cram it through a piece of software and see what answer we get. We'll, we'll do that on my computer over there in a minute. Let's do the analytical solution first. It kind of works analytically, but it's not super uh, satisfying. Let's go ahead and try it here. I'm going to erase this just to get it out of the way. Let's move this back up here. Well, let's do that in a minute. I'm going to get rid of this, clean this up a little bit. Now, remember that dv and dt, those are variables. Those are, now we don't know what they are. They're infinitesimally small. And we'll never have an actual number for either one of those. But we get to push them around just like any other variable. They have some special qualities because they're, they're uh, uh, derivatives. But we can push a dt and a dv around just like any other variable. Let's do that. For convenience, let's write this a little differently. Let's say that this is capital C V squared, where C is C D one half rho S. And this is just to keep things simpler. 
So um, let me uh, rewrite this. There, that'll keep things a little tidier. We know what C is, it's just a number. And uh, let's see if we can write this out as an equation where we can integrate to get rid of the, the uh, dv and dt. Well, the thing is I want to put everything with v on one side of the equation, everything with t on the other side. So what I'm going to wind up doing is let's divide through by m first. There. Now, you can see where we're headed here. Let's go back up here. And what I'm going to do is write dt is there. Okay, now I've got dt on everything with t in it on one side and everything with v in it on the other side. Well, how do you get rid of dt and dv? Well, you, you integrate. Well, go from time zero to time, whatever that is, and go from v zero, which we know to be zero, I erased it, but that's zero, to some value v. Don't know what that is either, but we can, what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to get t, and I'm going to get some function of v here. So I'm going to get v and t as it related by a uh, analytical expression, but they're kind of backwards. It, it turns out that v is going to be my independent variable, and I'm going to find the t that goes along with it. Now, I told you it wasn't going to be very satisfying, but there it is. The other way to do this is with finite differences or a differential equation solver, either one. What I can do there, let me get rid of, that, rid of this, so I'm going to say that dv dt is approximately equal to v2 minus, well, vn plus 1. There. Now here, I really do know what delta t is, and I really do know what those are. I'm going to calculate those. This is a finite difference approximation to that. This is the true derivative. This is an approximate derivative. But in exchange for going from an exact derivative to an approximate derivative, the problem gets a lot simpler to solve. If delta t is small enough, and by the way, we know what that is. That's going to be a number. We will assign that number, and n is just an index. So we'll start when where n equals 0, uh, velocity be 0. So my very first value of v will be 0. I'll figure out the next v. Reset the index, do it again. Reset the index, do it again. And I will be able to draw a picture of the function that solves this equation. Now I won't know what the actual function is, but I'll be able to draw a very accurate picture of it. For most problems, that's close enough. For most problems, being able to draw a picture of the solution rather than write it out as an equation is all we need. So let's go to my computer now and we'll try that. Okay, so here we are now on my computer and we're looking at a program called MathCAD, M-A-T-H-C-A-D. And it's uh, not the greatest name. It doesn't have anything to do with CAD. This is actually a number crunching program. And it's about the simplest way I know of to do technical calculations. Since you don't have to do a lot of programming and you can kind of just look at the screen and see what's going on. So I call this ping pong ball drop ODE example problem. And ODE stands for ordinary differential equation. The thing we wrote on the board earlier, that's an ordinary differential equation. So I started by just defining some uh, basic values that we need. Acceleration and gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. Ping pong balls are nice because they're very uniform and the mass of a ping pong ball is about two and a half grams. So that's 0 0.0025 kilograms. The diameter of ping pong balls is also very uniform. Turns out there's two sizes. There's 40 millimeter and 38 millimeter. I'm assuming we've got a 40 millimeter ping pong ball here. So its uh, diameter in meters is 0 0.040. Rho is the density of air at sea level, pretty much. I'm in West Lafayette, Indiana, so I'm pretty close to sea level. And I'm assuming that's about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Last thing is the drag coefficient. Now this has to be measured. You gotta look this up. And depending on uh, where you look and Reynolds numbers and some other things, you get slightly different values. But the bottom line here is 0 0.45 is a pretty good general value for a sphere. And this one's non-dimensional. There's no, there's no dimensions here. So there's the cross-sectional area. It's just pi over 4 times the diameter squared. That's the same thing as pi r squared. And so the cross-sectional area of ping pong ball in, cube, in square meters, a pretty small number, 
There's that capital C we defined on the board earlier. It's 3.394 times 10 to the negative 4, and that's going to be kilograms per meter, which is a funny unit. But uh, when you multiply that by V squared, you get a kilogram meter per second squared, which is newtons. So I defined a function here, t sub ex, and now I can't remember what the ex stands for. I think I, I meant explicit at the time. So this is time as a function of velocity. Now you'd normally want velocity as a function of time, but the math uh, doesn't make that very easy. It's a whole lot easier if you just do it this way and plot it assuming the independent variable v is on the vertical axis. So there's well, exactly what was on the board earlier, and there's that dv. MathCAD will integrate this for you, and it did. That's what's, what's going on here. And so by executing this command, there's now a function t sub ex of v. And I plotted it right here. There's t sub ex of v. And then I, I defined v here. I actually defined v to go from 0 to 8.5 in steps of 0.1. That's what that little command there means. Let me show you what happens when I turn on the symbol so you can see where all the points are. We'll use circles perhaps. There, there they all are. Well, those are hard to see. I can, I can make them farther apart if you want, but now that may change the answer a little bit, and it did. I should be clear, it didn't change the answers, uh, the plot, because the answer is actually different. It's not. That's an integral there. It's just that from there to there it doesn't have any points in it, so it just puts a straight line in it there for us. So maybe 0.25, we'll get another couple of points there. Right? Now, why did I go to 8.5? Well, I figured it out, and the terminal velocity, which is what you get when you uh, set mg, or the weight, equal to the aerodynamic force, because remember when you're at terminal velocity, acceleration is zero, so the weight has to equal the aerodynamic drag. I just set those equal. To equal to one another, solve for v, v sub term for terminal velocity. And I got 8.502. Well, I tried to sneak up on that as close as I could without actually going over it. So there's what I got. And there's the analytical solution. The other way to solve a differential equation, or an other way to solve a differential equation, is what's called a finite difference approximation. And there are a couple of different flavors of finite difference approximation. The simplest one is called a forward difference, so that's what I used here. And all I did was uh, do exactly what I did on the board and say rather than the right side being dv dt, I approximated it by a slope. Since I wrote this uh, program a little while ago, I actually used i rather than n for the counter. I apologize for that. So on the board where I had v of n plus 1 minus v of n all over delta t, now it's just i's, but there's v of i plus 1, there's v of i, there it is again, and there's delta t. So you can see I, I've solved for the, the v I don't know in terms of the one I do. The one I do know when i equals 0, v equals 0. I knew what that was, so that's my starting point. Got it defined up there. Once I know the velocity at time delta t based on the time uh, velocity at time 0, there it is. I can just bring that over here, index plus 1, do it again. Bring that back over here, index plus 1, do it again, and just keep going. Now you can see here's a plot showing the forward difference and the, the integral solution. They aren't quite the same. Remember that my finite difference approximation is just that. It's an approximation. If I want it to be better, I'm going to have to make delta t smaller. So let's do that real quick. I said delta t is 0.1. Whoops. Try this again. Here we go. Let's make it 0 0.5. Let's cut it in half. So there we go. And as I make delta t smaller and smaller, the curve defined by those red circles, I get closer and closer to that blue curve that was defined by my integral. And you can see here that it's closing in asymptotically on some value. Well, what's that value? It better be terminal velocity, 8.502. It sure looked like it there. 
and it sure looks like it here as well. So there you have it. There's how to solve for the uh, motion of a falling ball with aerodynamic drag. Rather than having a nice, simple algebraic expression, we now wound up with a differential equation. But it's not a very hard one, and solving it isn't very hard. So I hope this helps, and we'll talk to you next time.